Welcome everyone to AURI Connects Fields of Innovation, part of AURI Connects monthly online series featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. I'm Dan Skogan, AURI's Director of Industry and Government Relations, and your host for Fields of Innovation. The AURI Connects program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. Fields of Innovation is focused on bringing together Minnesota's regional ag and food value chains to build capacity and successfully commercialize new and emerging crops uh, and events. Remember that this event is being recorded and archived and can be found at auri.org. Also remember that participants are muted, but you can ask questions through the Q&A portal on your screen. Now today our program will take a deep dive into the aquaculture industry of Minnesota. We will see how the industry is evolving, growing, and developing as it tries to meet the consumer demands around fish consumption and the industry needs as it grows. Leading our panel discussion today will be Harold Stanislavski. Harold is the Business Development Director for AURI. And in that role, Harold works with EURI staff and clients to bring their ideas and products to the marketplace. So Harold, welcome to Fields of Innovation. Well, thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here again this morning to, well, this afternoon actually, to talk about this uh, very exciting topic of aquaculture and particularly aquaculture here in Minnesota as it grows and develops into a very prosperous sector. First, I wanna just briefly discuss a little bit about who AURI is and a little bit of our resource overview for the listeners out there. Next slide. AURI programming evolved around a nonprofit corporation uh, created by the Minnesota legislature over 30 years ago to increase the utilization of Minnesota's rich agricultural resources. Uh, we work in four primary areas, one being food, and we'll touch on that today as we look at aquaculture as a great food and seafood and nutritious product. There are the co-products of which aquaculture has many with uh, the fish waste, for instance, that can be turned into pet food, fertilizer, and even high value pharmaceutical products. We also work in bio-based products and renewable energy as part of our other efforts at AURI. So thinking about this, uh, go back, Ray, please, uh, to commercialization services where we can work with projects on a one-to-one -one basis uh, on things like business, the feasibility, the hands-on technical expertise that our staff, both business-wise and our technical teams can provide. We also have an entrepreneur and residence program where certain businesses can use our lab and equipment sharing to benefit their own initiative. We also have public initiatives of which the one that we are about to discuss today is one of those uh, where we did a comprehensive study on the aquaculture industry. The, this information again is free to all. It's applied uh, research and development for the industry and we also do ag innovation partnerships which catalyze this activity with our industry partners. Uh, this program is part of AURI Connects, which is industry convening, public dissemination of our research projects and reports, and our webinar Wednesdays, of which we've done for quite a while now, called Fields of Innovation, of which this is one. Next slide. Our guiding principles are to uh, provide affordable access to consumer with science and technical expertise and infrastructure. And we work with a lot of different groups across the state including the University of Minnesota, which we are very proud to be associated with, initiative funds, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and many others, including Grow North, who's part of this uh, very nice Food and Ag Innovations Week. Next slide. So we're gonna get into something now. Uh, this is the report, uh, the cover of the report that uh, AURI put together along with our consultants called Minnesota Aquaculture, opportunities and challenges. And you're gonna be able to take a look at this report on www.auri.org. But just to make a few comments here before we get started that globally, aquaculture is one of the fastest uh, growing food industries. The key drivers are 
technological development, increased production, and growing understanding of the health benefits of fish consumption. You know, in 2016, according to the Food Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, aquaculture was served as the primary source of fish available for human consumption. But only about one in five Americans are considered frequent fish and seafood purchasers. This may be changing. And however, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, the fish and seafood sector saw record sales across multiple categories in the past year. Over a third reported they would pay more for products raised in Minnesota, and those sustainably raised and nearly half agreed they would pay more, more for fish that benefit the state's economy. And as we get into this report, uh, and as the, the readers look on our website for it, what you're going to find is many categories of very useful information, including the national fish and seafood trends, how Minnesota is evolving into the agricultural industry, You'll, you'll hear about technology from open aquaculture, aquaculture ponds, net pens, raceways, closed aquaculture, RAS systems and aquaponics and more. Uh, disease control and detection and many of those kinds of things are also discussed in this report, as well as fish nutrition, soybeans for aquafeed, opportunities for seafood waste in Minnesota, to name a few. Regulations and policy is extremely important in this emerging sector. And you'll hear uh, issues surrounding that part as well. So there are many things to consider here with the market opportunities, the consumer education and so forth. And this re comprehensive report has a lot of that in it. Next slide, Ray, please. I am so excited to introduce the panel today and I'm gonna do it one by one and then they'll give their talk and then I'll introduce the next panel after that. But our first speaker is uh, Dr. Nick Phelps, who is the director of the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Nick Phelps uh, studies emerging threats to aquatic systems at both the macro and micro microbial scale in the fields of fish health and aquatic invasive species, which lie at the intersection of animals, humans, and the environment. He'll, his goal is to identify threats, understand the risks, and ultimately develop long-term evidence-based management solutions to balance the needs of all relevant stakeholders. With that, Nick, I am uh, very glad and happy to introduce Dr. Nick Phelps uh, for the next part of our program. All right, thank you, Harold. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, well, thank you for the um, invitation to be here today and for the introduction. Um, I, sh I should point out that although I'm the uh, director of Research Center focused on invasive species, uh, my background is um, quite heavy in aquaculture. So although the two topics intersect uh, quite often, um, I've worked on a variety of aquaculture things and I'll um, highlight some of those here in just a bit, but I wanted to begin my comments with just a brief overview of the uh, history of aquaculture here in Minnesota, just to sort of lay the, the groundwork for what you're gonna hear from um, the producers. So fish farming in Minnesota is um, not new. It's been around for a long, long time um, with the, the, the essentially all of that production being focused on sport fish for stocking lakes. So fishermen can go and catch them and bait. So people can go and use those to catch those fish. Um, so that sport fish and bait fish industries are um, decades old, um, almost always farmed extensively in natural ponds or shallow lakes, highly productive systems where they put the fish in and get them back out later in the year. Now this form of farming um, has very low investment and there's lots of pros to it. There are some challenges though, including environmental impacts and just the natural volatility of these systems that can result in um, unpredictable yields. So over the last couple of decades here in Minnesota and around the world, there's been an increased interest in moving fish production indoors into controlled systems where all those environmental factors can not only be controlled but optimized to specifically suited to the species that they're raising. 
And as they move the fish indoors, um, the priority has been not fish for uh, stocking and for bait, but for food. There's many um, opportunities in these indoor systems for species across taxa and a, um, a variety of fish. Uh, salmon is probably top of that list. Um, barramundi, um, shrimp, of course, you'll hear about it in a little bit. Um, many systems, many species, um, many opportunities. Now there's uh, challenges though inherent in moving these wild animals into captive facilities. Um, the report that Harold uh, referenced highlights some of these challenges, but just to quickly name a few, the upfront costs of these types of indoor systems can be quite high. And the long-term economic viability of these systems, when you consider the life cycles of these fish, um, can be a bit uncertain right now. So that's an area of um, ongoing work and relationship building and research that uh, must continue. Uh, many of these species um, are not domesticated in the way that they are for poultry and cattle. Um, those folks may take that for granted now, but fish are coming straight from the wild and uh, that domestication process, the selective breeding, um, all of that still needs to be done in contained intensive systems, there's a disease um, risk that can get amplified quickly, and that's a, a, um, a challenge for some of these new systems as they come online. And there are questions, um, although we see a huge opportunity in the early surveys um, suggest that the market might be vast, um, we do have some uh, marketing and um, uh, seasonality questions that I think need to be looked at too. Social license is a an important thing to consider, um, especially in a water-rich state like Minnesota. And there are regulations that are um, unique to aquaculture compared to other animal production systems um, here in Minnesota at the state level and then at the federal level as well. Now these, I just listed off a bunch of challenges and I maybe should have started with more of the opportunities, but um, I don't think that any of those challenges are insurmountable. And I think that's important for folks to keep in mind as we go through this discussion, that although there are questions, um, questions are meant to be answered. And for those who can answer them, I think there'll be um, a really big opportunity to be at that leading edge of an emerging market with which we think is quite big. So um, I encourage you to keep an open mind as we go through the conversation and um, see if there's opportunities for you and the things you work on. But I want to mention quickly too, the, um, I'm at the University of Minnesota. I want to give you a little sense of what the U of M has done on aquaculture in the past and what we're doing now. The U of M has been working in aquaculture for decades. Um, this isn't uh, a new fad for us. It's been a long-term commitment of the university to this type of production system. I'll just give you some examples back in the, um, you know, decades 80s uh, into the 90s, there was a lot of work on environmental impacts of aquaculture in natural ponds, so the outdoor production system, um, and a lot of work trying to innovate both the um, production methods and approaches for um, bait and sport fish. Then in the late 90s, there was quite a bit of work looking at transgenic fish, the idea of genetically engineering fish to grow faster or to have desirable traits um, that might be better suited for a production system compared to those fish that come straight from the wild. And we see that now with the Aquabounty salmon, but um, back in the, the 90s, um, we tried it at the U for both walleye and tilapia. And the, um, if you track some of that work, it's interesting to note that the sleepy, Sleeping Beauty transposon, this, huge breakthrough in genetic engineering was actually developed during the pursuit of genetically engineered walleye. So that aquaculture project led to this huge breakthrough for human health and many other things. Now I've been at the U uh, for about 15 years now and I've worked on a variety of species, um, freshwater and marine, across different system types, including traditional aquaculture ponds, these indoor intensive production systems, 
and a fair bit related to aquaponics, where you grow the fish and plants together in one integrated system. Now my PhD was in veterinary medicine, and so I've, I've spent a lot of um, my sort of research focus looking at animal health, um, fish health and disease, how to diagnose it, prevent it, and um, keep it from spreading within the system and between systems. We've done a, a fair bit though with uh, food safety as it relates to aquaculture products. We've done market assessments. Um, we've done a bit of system design, trying to optimize these systems to better filter water. Um, how do you raise more fish with the same amount of, of water is a, an important question. We've done quite a bit with risk assessments, and this is where the invasive species component comes in here. Um, a lot of these species that are being raised may be an invasive species here in Minnesota, um, like Barramundi, for example, or they may harbor disease that could spread to wild fish. So there's regulatory implications there and the risk of that we've tried hard to understand. And we've taught a, um, a class in aquaponics for a few years. We aren't doing it right now, but um, that was a fairly popular class on campus. I'm excited um, about the, the future of aquaculture work at the University of Minnesota. Um, I should point out that um, Minnesota Sea Grant, um, based up in Duluth, has recently um, uh, re-energized their aquaculture program with two new hires who are focused on food fish production, bait production, um, trying to bring these industries uh, forward as best they can in um, fairly innovative ways. A lot of conversations happening on campus, but I am excited for where this is going to go in the future. And if you're interested um, now or beyond, don't hesitate to reach out to me or anybody else on campus. We'd be happy to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Phelps, for that uh, information. Uh, we'll get back to Dr. Nick uh, Phelps uh, during the question and answer period uh, a little later, but for right now, we'll move on to our next speaker. Ray, would you mind um, moving the slide forward? It's my pleasure to introduce to you Jessica Coburn, who is the Vice President of Business Development with Blue Water Farms. Uh, Jessica is helping with the startup uh, on business presentations, project development, grant writing, as well as scientific development. Her experience includes aquacultural feed research with refined alfalfa protein, healthy cooking, gardening, and aquaponics demonstrations for students, scouting clubs, mitigation tracking for wetlands and surface waters, and long range community planning for growth and development. She holds a bachelor's degree in environmental science and resource management from the University of Washington and a master's in agroecology from the University of Minnesota. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Jessica Coburn with Blue Water Farms. Thank you, Harold. Can you guys all hear me? Am I muted? We can hear you, Jessica. We can hear, we can okay. hear you, Jessica. Just Sorry. making sure. All right, well, thank you for that introduction, Harold. And as you said, I um, am with Blue Water Farms and also a board member of Minnesota Aquaculture Association. And this first picture here is from my graduate research a couple of years ago when I was researching refining alfalfa for perch and trout feeds. I had the great opportunity to work with AURI, their researchers and engineers to complete that project. And um, during my research and during my work with other professionals, I really got to learn about aquaculture so much that it brought the passion and excitement for our opportunities in the future to come forward about a blue foods rev revolution, which next slide. So I bring this up because there are a lot of um, growing awarenesses and assumptions that come out about blue foods or simply put seafoods, both from the wild and aquaculture, animals and plants. Um, and we hear all the time that they're great for our health and great for the climate, but um, they kind of come off as too good to be true or, or too many assumptions made. And the blue food assessment was set up as a um, 
collaboration of researchers around the globe, led by the Stockholm and Stanford universities, to assess these assumptions and really see can blue foods do everything that we say they can do. And a couple of weeks ago, they released some research that confirmed that a lot of what we say is really true. And I'm gonna share some headlines with you about that research. We can go through them. Blue food may be a green way to feed more people. The uh, blue foods are a missing ingredient for a sustainable future. We can harness the world's aquatic blue food systems to help end hunger and a blue food revolution could feed the world without ruining the planet. So with all that exciting potential put out there, besides the challenges that Dr. Phelps mentioned, I want to tell you about the two organizations that I'm working with because it's an uh, exciting time. Next slide, thank you. Blue Water Farms is a startup walleye farm. We are pre-revenue right now with the goal to raise a thousand tons of walleye each year in a sustainable and innovative way local here to Minnesota. Next slide. Our farm-raised walleye will um, be a lot of the things that walleye, wild walleye are, but also have other benefits. They um, are going to be pollutant-free and best practices certified, available year-round for a consistent supply, which is something that we hear a lot of concern about from wild walleye. And both the fish and the feed we use will be fully traceable and high quality. Next slide. Our farm is built on innovative technology. As you heard from Nick Phelps, that um, a lot of the farming interest is moving indoors. And the way that we're approaching that is recirculation aquaculture, which um, reuses the water and it can be used with aquaponics or on its own. And one of the great, or a few of the great benefits about the system is that you have a great amount of control over the variables. You're not subject to all of the environmental changes of heat or drought, which we've experienced a lot of this year, or um, you know, extreme colds and birds coming to eat your fish and other things. We also um, have a lot of control about the source of our water and feed and really what goes into the system and what comes out. And one of the great things about recirculation is the efficiency in the design uses one tenth or less of the water used in flow through systems on average. So we believe it really hits on some of the great sustainable goals. Um, our marketing team, thank you, has documented a strong market for walleye already, both for fingerlings for the stocking market, which is traditional, and the filet market into the food fish realm. Next slide. While we've seen market potential around the world and especially all over North America, our first focus is on the 12 state region that really has a cultural identi identity that um, hinges on sport fish and walleye where it's widely recognized. The region has 14 million households that on average eat three pounds of freshwater fish each year, which sums up to about $360 million spent on freshwater fish just in these 12 state regions. And we believe that because walleye is widely recognized in the region for taste and nutrition and the identity that um, we will have no problem selling out of a thousand tons a year once we get there. Next slide. Our team is led by uh, founder and CEO Clarence Bischoff. He comes to us from the human services world, but has also been a farmer. And um, when moving out of human services, came to more and more realization about how the farming systems impact our climate and is really driven by the passion to um, find a better way and found aquaculture and hasn't looked back since. Dean DeVallis, our board chair and architect, 
is LEAD certified. He um, has started his own firm in Minneapolis and helps a lot of other companies also start businesses. Right now, he is working on two farm projects beyond ours in Djibouti, Africa, and down in New Orleans. Next slide. As for our other team members, we have a lot of consultants and advisors that are helping us with our marketing and our business and also our technology and research side. And I figured I'd introduce you to our researchers. You already heard that I'm involved in that. And Ed Anish Hansley, our chief technical officer, has more than 20 years experience in building recirculating systems. So he has seen a lot of their ups and downs, the technology challenges and um, helped refine them and build them back better and develop the technology. Daniel Zarski is a researcher in Poland and really focuses on perkin breeding, um, which is the family that houses walleye. And he is helping us to really understand the challenges and opportunities that we can face in providing year-round egg supply so that um, we are not limited to seasonality. Greg Fisher is an aquaculture researcher next door in Wisconsin, and he has been working on domesticating walleye with the team over there for more than 20 years as well. Next slide. So these researchers and the um, goals that Clarence set out for us really make the innovations in walleye exciting for our business that we are going to be the first to domesticate walleye at a true commercial scale, first to out of season spawn them and have RAS specific or recirculating aquaculture specific broodstock breeding pairs. Next slide. We have this big dream, big goal. And as you heard before, um, setting up these system costs a lot. And so we need investments. And we have also set it out in stages of development so that we can really build upon showing that we can produce what we say we will. Our first facility will focus on the brood stock and sell fingerlings to the stocking market. And then once we have that up and running and showing that um, all of our goals are met, we can add on the grow out and possibly hydroponics, aquaponics facilities so that we can bring the food fish to market. And since we believe we'll easily sell out within the 12 state region, we see this business scaling up and creating new facilities around the nation in other localities. Next slide. I wanted to also tell you about the Minnesota Aquaculture Association because it focuses on more than walleye and um, it's to be a little bit more of an advocate for the industry. Next slide. Our mission is to promote the long-term sustainability and viability of the industry. And we do include everything from food fish to bait and sport fish, anything in between. Next slide. I like to bring up this DNR picture of the fish in Minnesota because we do have a lot of variety and a lot of them have already been supported by aquaculture over time. Next slide. Um, pausing here a little bit to talk about the history of the Minnesota Aquaculture Association. We had one previously, but due to the downturn in the economy in the early 2000s and low membership, it closed in 2010. But our current association was restarted after um, a 2017 workshop by the University of Minnesota and Sea Grant. We were hearing all of the excitement around aquaculture and um, a lot of people interested in taking classes or doing research or starting businesses. And they saw um, a lot of counteracting goals and wanted to get the professionals together to say, okay, what do we need? Do we need more research into certain topics or do we need policy changes? And one of their key findings was that we need to reorganize the association so that we have an industry voice who can really speak up and advocate for what we need. Next slide. 
So we were reorganized in 2019 and we have a board of seven, mem seven of our members. And just highlighting these four quickly so that you can have some faces to put with the industry. We've got Chad Hebert here, who's treasurer. Chad has been farming yellow perch for years and currently works right now with the Little Earth of United Tribes in Minneapolis. With them, he's supporting their mission by um, incorporating aquaculture to help the community nutrition plan, as well as to educate and empower their youth on a new track. Karen Clark, our government relations chair, um, is formerly a Minnesota state representative and currently the executive director at the Women's Environmental Institute. They um, teach an eight month course on aquaponics. And for the association, Karen is really key to leading up our efforts on creating a statewide plan for aquaculture so that we can bring those goals together. Barry Foley, our bait industry chair, has been in aquaculture and bait farming since 1987. And he was a member of the previous association and has been in the industry for um, as long as, however many years it's been, that he's really seen a lot of the changes and is a strong voice for um, seeing past the here and now and where we've been and where we should be going and really helps to bring in the broader perspective of the industry. And finally, Tony Bang, our membership chair, is highlighted here um, as a tilapia farmer who was doing aquaponics for restaurant sales and really had to change course due to the pandemic, which I chose to highlight. And he's now involved in bait fish research with Barry and a few others. So next slide. Our association has a few goals in their strategic plan. And the first one, we're already on top of rebuilding the association. And um, one of our key parts of fostering the industry is to get out there and tell our aquaculture story. We, in America, as consumers, don't hear as much about um, positive aquaculture adventures or how it already exists in our state. We have about 150 aquaculture licenses out right now and not too many of us Minnesotans know that they're there. And number two, we also want to, as I mentioned before, create a unified aquaculture plan for a statewide set of priorities and a plan on how we want to get to those goals. We're working on that now. We have a meeting in a couple weeks to continue that discussion. Next slide. Some of our future goals would be to hire a state aquaculture coordinator that can really help improve agency and fish farm interactions, and also to create fish, create funding streams and fee structures that will support farms around Minnesota. Next slide. The last two goals I just point out, even though they're ever present and ongoing, is to encourage best practices in aquaculture around the state and that we like to share information and really build on that foundation of partnership and information sharing through an annual workshop. We have a partnership with the Wisconsin Association to provide our next big meeting in February next year. And the information on that is coming out soon. Next slide. At the association, we believe that Minnesota has the potential to become a leader in aquaculture Minnesota has the clean water, well-trained scientists, engineers, management professionals, and the capital to make it happen. So there's a lot of opportunity here. Next slide. Just bringing it back to Blue Water Farms because we are looking for investors and also put my information up here if you have any questions or investment interest. Thank you and we'll pass it along. Well, thank you, Jessica. That was a fantastic presentation. And I just want to say, uh, Jessica and the entire team at Blue Water is really impressive. They really do have a lot of expertise within their team. And uh, we certainly wish you all the best as you move forward. Um, it's the little train that could, and it's coming. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, next slide, Ray. 
Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our last uh, couple of speakers here. They, they will work at, at this as a team. And uh, first, I want to introduce uh, uh, Barb Frank. Uh, Barb uh, was a poultry producer uh, raising replacement laying hens. And after the avian influenza outbreak in 2015, the market was in shambles. Uh, with one barn empty and the outlook not improving for the remaining three, Barbara and her daughter, who was a partner in the operation, began looking for another use for the large building. After meeting with Paul Damhoff a number of times, Barbara started an experimental hatchery to help alleviate the problem of lack of PLs, which are baby shrimp in the United States. Barbara's daughter, Becky, turned the empty barn into a shrimp raising operation. In 2020, Barbara and Paul moved the hatchery to Paul's farm to develop a commercial hatchery. Currently, they are spawning broodstock and raising algae and beginning with the hatching and raising of PLs. Again, that's baby shrimp. We'll be very much interested in hearing from Barbara. I also want to introduce Paul at the same time here. Uh, Paul Damhoff uh, from Bloomquist, Minnesota, retired from the dairy business after 50 years of milk and cows. I can't believe he's that old. He <laughs> retire from raising livestock completely. Today, instead of uh, Holstein dairy cows filling the barn, there were thousands of Pacific white shrimp being raised in what was once a calving barn. Uh, Pal Domhoff uh, founded Simply Shrimp LLC and assisting him, of course, were members of his family. And after res researching the idea in 2016, uh, Paul decided to begin this new adventure in shrimp farming. While the animals changed, the Damhoff's dedication to providing the best possible product has not. I've been out to Paul's farm a number of times and I can tell you the shrimp raised there is second to none. Uh, Paul set out and still does to sell Minnesota farm grown 100% hormone and antibiotic free shrimp to the public when his new operation gets up. Simply shrimp are all natural, never frozen, and the freshest shrimp you'll find in Minnesota. So Simply Shrimp sells direct to consumers from the family on, on their farm just south of Wilmer. And with that, uh, Paul, Barb, uh, take it away. Thank you, Harold. Uh, I do want to give you a heads up. If uh, I lose internet connection, uh, we'll be right back on in a couple seconds. Our internet might be giving us problems today, but uh, I'm going to hand the floor over. Thanks for the introduction and let uh, Barb have the floor and let her speak. So I'm starting with the part relating to the hatchery because that's the part I'm a partner in. The grow operation is Paul's and there's another operation like that on my farm that's my daughter's. So. Like Harold said in his introduction, my background was in poultry. And also like Paul, who was in dairy and faced with declining markets in a mature industry, I had to look at another direction. In 2019, Paul and I helped start the research hatchery in Richmond because the biggest glitch, as Harold said, to the future of the shrimp industry in Minnesota and in fact, in the entire US, which Paul had already proved the industry could be profitable, was getting the PLs or baby shrimp. Our hatchery is now on the Damhoff farm south of Wilmer and is one of the first inland shrimp hatcheries in the US. There's some big advantages to inland hatcheries, the biggest of them being the ability to begin with clean disease-free water away from the ocean and from all the issues associated with that. There are also huge disadvantages, the greatest of that being the sheer cost of creating artificial seawater. There's not much information available out there to help guide as we develop the hatchery. Luckily, Paul had many relationships with many of the experts in the shrimp industry in the US, and he had learned to raise shrimp before switching to the hatchery. A little background on shrimp before I talk about our challenges in progress. Once a female shrimp bond, spawns a fertilized egg and it hatches, the hatchlings go through four different stages, each of which can have mul multiple stages within it. In addition, they go from being herbivores in the first stage to carnivores in the second and omnivores in the third and fourth. 
The last stage is PLs or post larval. It generally takes 21 days from stage one to PL12, which is the age most commonly shipped to the growers. So our challenges, the first challenge was acclimating the brood stock or the breeding pairs to our water. Best case scenario for this is about three weeks. It took us more than six weeks to accomplish it on our first group. However, once we accomplished that, we were able to get them to mate and spawn without much difficulty. And again, I point out, there is no manual or instructions for this. It was learned by trial and error. One of the problems with the hatchery, the research hatchery, was raising algae. Algae is one of the main foods for young shrimp, particularly in the first stage. The algae is raised on site. Setting up and managing a disease-free algae lab became a prior priority because, after all, it is the first feed for the nebulae, which is stage one. And if we didn't have clean, nutritious algae, we couldn't feed the nebulae once we got them. With Ari's help, we had a PhD algae specialist and a few industry people help us create our algae lab and set up our practices, which is currently very successful. We do anticipate we may, may have some new challenges as we scale it up when, once we bring the hatchery on at full capacity. Figuring out the components of feeding and raising the young hatchlings has proven to be a huge challenge. The number of things that need watching are staggering. Water temperatures, pH, alkalinity, salinity, ammonia, nitrates, nitrites are tested regularly. Figuring out how to count how many nebulae or baby shrimp we have has been challenging. And if we don't know how many we have, how can we know whether or not we're overfeeding them or underfeeding them? Overfeeding leads to problems with water quality. Knowing the shell, cell count of our algae itself is what determines how much to feed them. And that's another challenging issue that we are learning. Each of these issues have been faced again by trial and error. We're, we believe we are getting close to handling each of these problems and will soon have PLs for sale. This will be the first true Minnesota shrimp in history. There are many things on both the hatchery end and the raising end that will be necessary to make the shrimp industry viable in Minnesota. The hatchery is and was one of the first ones. However, affordable continuous monitoring equipment for the of catastrophic loss are too great. Additionally, there are feeding systems in development on the raising side that greatly improve the current ones. This is a fledgling industry that has a lot of potential, but at the same time, it needs a lot of help to develop. COVID was rough on all existing Minnesota shrimp farmers. They were struggling with PL availability before COVID ever hit, and it made it exponentially worse. In addition, since most were struggling when it hit, the programs developed to help businesses make it through COVID often didn't apply, or when they did, did at very small levels. Most, if not all, shrimp operations are barely hanging on. For us, it has also brought challenges in sourcing and receiving the live feeds we need for, need for broodstock help. Last month, after more than 10 days of waiting, our frozen bloodworms arrived from Amsterdam, linking, leaking from the boxes, worthless. Paul and I both see great potential for rural Minnesota to raise sustainable shrimp, particularly if systems can be developed that can be retrofitted into the many livestock buildings in the area that are empty. The future will tell if this happens. In the meantime, we are working hard on our part to pr produce the first Minnesota PLs in, the his in history. And the first of those will go to my farm and become the very first 100% Minnesota shrimp in history. 
This, uh, I'm so blessed and so thankful to have Barb as a partner in uh, Minnesota Shrimp. Um, you know, the, the hatchery, the hatchery is our foundation here in Minnesota for, uh, for having a, a, a viable shrimp, shrimp industry. The, the hatchery is, is uh, the base, the foundation um, for profitability to, to be sustainable. And, and uh, that's why I'm so blessed to have Barb uh, helping, helping out on the hatchery. Uh, when, a, when a shrimp is born, uh, a baby, when a baby is born, they're actually three quarters the size of a mosquito larvae. So uh, we do a lot of work underneath the microscope. Um, you know, when, when I went to school, I did not like science, chemistry, biology, and heaven forsakes uh, the metric system. And uh, here it's been a complete new learning curve. Uh, everything is back underneath the microscope, uh, managing the water and uh, having to deal with the darn metric system again, it's been another steep, steep learning curve. Um, and again, every day is a new challenge and, and we're excited about it and we keep, uh, keep moving forward. Um, like Harold said, uh, born and raised on a dairy farm, uh, we still, still run crops here, uh, still very active with the uh, field work. Um, we started back in 2017 is when uh, Simply Shrimp was established. Uh, that's when we got our first PLs. Um, I, I can tell you, uh, we, I, I could tell you a thousand and one ways how not to raise a shrimp. Um, again, like Barb said, there's not a manual that's written for uh, raising shrimp. And, and that's one thing that really uh, made me passionate or excited me about the shrimp industry is, is because um, when I started researching and digging into raising shrimp, where do you turn to? You, you turn to the internet. And of course, everything is true and factual that you read on the internet, true, uh, too, anyway. So it, it just, it, it motivated me and, and uh, what, what does it take uh, to be raising shrimp here in the state of Minnesota and uh, can, it, can it be profi uh, profitable? Um, you know, we're reproducing the ocean environment to the best of our ability. We can't get any farther away from uh, ocean water than, than where we're at. And we are doing it and we're doing it uh, successfully. So back in 2017, like Harold said, uh, this is a dairy farm. Uh, we remodeled uh, where we had our baby calves at, a uh, full, full remodel. Uh, again, this is a saltwater environment, uh, very corrosive. And uh, uh, we built the facility or, or built the building that uh, is going to handle it for uh, longevity. Now, again, starting in, um, we made the decisions with the knowledge and wisdom that we had at the time. Um, are there better ways of being more efficient, more productive? Um, yes, and like Harold said, uh, this next expansion project, uh, we will be more, more efficient and uh, we're excited about it. So from the time, I'm gonna back up to uh, the PLs. When we get a PL12 in uh, coming out of the hatchery, uh, from the time that we bring a PL12 in, they weigh 0 0.0002 grams. And we like to have them up to a 20, 20 gram shrimp in approximately 90 days. Um, so we, we're looking at a 90 day turn per batch. Uh, we're able to market 100% of our shrimp right out the front, uh, front door here. Uh, the, the market, uh, it, it's just like Harold said, once you've had fresh shrimp, you'll never eat a frozen one again. Here in the United States, we import 88% of the shrimp that we consume uh, here in the United States. So to have a sustainable, traceable shrimp uh, from the feed, uh, everything, um, it, 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 it really says, says a lot. Um, having Barb Online or Minnesota Shrimp, uh, it's also given us the opportunity to look at different genetic lines. Um, Barb and I have spent time uh, researching what is the best genetic lines that are going to fit our qualifications. Uh, you know, we, we can look at a shrimp that's a, a very fast uh, rate of gain, but the survival rate um, um, is challenging, or we can get uh, genetic lines that uh, are, are very hardy. Uh, survival rate is, is outstanding, but uh, uh, it, it takes such a long time to get them, get them up to that 20, 20 count stage anyways. So, um, like Barb had said, uh, this is a new industry here. Uh, there's a lot of research that is being done. Um, we've also had the opportunity to work with a, a Minnesota company here and have input in on uh, a, a processing machine. Uh, all of the shrimp in the world are de-headed, de-veined by hand. 
And uh, it, it's just been really fun working with this uh, Minnesota company uh, over the past couple of years uh, on uh, seeing, seeing how they've progressed and how they've made progress. And, uh, you know, I, I'm excited. I'm personally excited because this machine will be utilized uh, throughout, throughout the world. Um, we've done uh, uh, research as far as the freezing, uh, the quality, the freshness of the meat. Um, like Barb had made a comment, um, uh, there's a feeding system that's uh, in the process of being worked on. Um, actually, it'll be coming down to Barb's uh, very quickly for uh, R&D. And uh, I, I'm just, I'm excited about the shrimp industry here in the, in the upper Midwest and, and Minnesota and, and being able to put Minnesota on the map. And uh, uh, like Barbara made the comment, there's so many buildings out there available. Um, can we keep the family farm uh, successful? And uh, it, it's just going to take some time, some research, and uh, Barb and I are gonna give it the best of our ability and see what we can do down the road. Thank you, uh, thank you, Paul and, and Barb. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan Scogan now. We're gonna go through some questions, but uh, I'll probably come back and uh, ask you folks some specific questions at the end, but uh, Dan, go ahead. Thanks, Harold, and thanks to everyone who, who did a presentation today, great stuff. And I just wanna uh, make a quick note. I, I do wanna note that, uh, first of all, I did not uh, identify that this was part of the uh, Food and Ag Ideas Week programming. Uh, in that my screen went blank just before I uh, handed it off to Harold, and I had intended to mention that. Do want to uh, uh, announce our, our support and our appreciation of collaboration that we get with Grow North, and hope that you'll be able to take in many of their programs uh, this week on food and egg ideas. Uh, we did have some uh, difficulty with connectivity at the start of our program today, so for those of you that joined us late uh, for this event, uh, we are recording it and the entire conversation uh, will be made available at auri.org. So before we uh, move along, Jessica, I'm gonna ask you to uh, come back into the room uh, for just a little bit because uh, we uh, are, are generating some questions as people listen to the presentations today. And uh, one of the questions that came in was, uh, are, are others raising walleye, I guess? And, uh, uh, and why is fully traceable important? I, I heard Paul mention it, and I heard you mention it. Uh, why is that an important piece to include in the in the discussion? Sure. Um, first, are other people farming walleye? Yes, there are <clears throat> most definitely several farms that are raising the fingerlings to stock around the state and in other states as well. And there are a few farms out there that are trying to raise food food fish walleye, but they're not at a size yet that could um, regularly supply restaurants or grocery stores or whatever. So when we talk about a thousand ton operation, which is our goal, we are um, setting up a level that we can consistently supply the market. Why is traceability so important to Blue Water? Yeah. Traceability is important to us because not only in walleye, but in several fish, um, there, we get so many fish imported from around the world and we can't keep up with all the imports that um, some are brought in that we don't know exactly what their origin is or whether they're actually walleye on the plate. So um, knowing what we're getting, where it's been, and that it is what we say it is, is important to maintain our sustainability goals and our health goals. Paul, uh, you and Barb mentioned traceability as well. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? You know, as far as traceability goes, you know, from, from our feed, we get all of our feed uh, out in Pennsylvania, Ziegler feeds. I mean, that's all traceable. Uh, I'll, I'll just, Dan, I'm going to come back and say um, the shrimp that we import here in the United States uh, they can grow shrimp a little differently than what we can here in the United States. And, uh, you know, we, we can't use antibiotics, uh, probiotics here in the United States. And, uh, um, you know, to be traceable, to be able to uh, trace that shrimp from day one until uh, it's been harvested, processed, and out the door, uh, sustainable, um, yeah, it, it's, it's huge. And, and that's what the consumer is driven at right now, too, is, 
is they want to know where their walleye, their shrimp, where their food is coming from that, that the consumer wants to know. And there is a value on that. Nick, uh, from the University of Minnesota's perspective, uh, uh, where are we headed on with aquaculture R and D? I guess, and, and what are some of the? Uh, have you identified some of the bigger barriers to moving this industry forward? Yeah, some of the barriers. I mean, yeah, there, there are um, barriers that we're working on now include identifying markets, um, disease management. Um, those are probably the two as far as food fish go that we're working on right now. And, and thinking about others that we might have in the pipeline, um, cryopreservation of fish eggs um, or shrimp, like that's one that's emerging too, that could open up some very significant doors if that works out. Um, selective breeding would be important as these fish um, become in and shrimp become increasingly domesticated. Um, feeds and uh, sustainable feed ingredients that are um, good for both the environment and fish growth are important. And we've done some work on that. Um, Jessica's master's project. Um, yeah, th there's a lot going on on a number of fronts. Um, unfortunately, we, we can't work on them all at the same time. So we're um, working down a list. We have uh, shrimp and walleye represented here today. Are those the two most promising? Or are there other species that hold a lot of promise? And I those are that up to whoever wants to tackle it. Nick, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'll, from my vantage point, those are both uh, um, walleye is a, obviously a locally important species, a um, very interested consumer base. Shrimp are uh, globally and here in Minnesota a um, very important uh, seafood product. So that's an important one as well. Other species that may have potential in the future here in Minnesota be yellow perch and perhaps Atlantic salmon, among others. Uh, Paul and Barb, uh, we do have uh, someone who would like your email address. So if you could add that to our chat portal uh, on your screen, we would appreciate that. And I don't know uh, what if we're uh, getting into proprietary areas, but Jessica, there was a question about ingredients in your feed. What ingredients are you using in your feeds? And uh, also they were wondering about the timing of the development of your brood stock, stock in your grow up facilities. Do you have a kind of a timeline that you're working uh, toward uh, getting all of that put together? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, once we get the investments that are needed, we anticipate being able to open up our broodstock facility within about a year and a half. And um, I would say that the grow out facility could follow within three years, depending on, again, further investments and proving out the success of the first facility. And on the ingredients, we are planning to start off with the industry standard best practices, which are typical feeds from spreading and other um, feed suppliers with both fish meal and soy in them. But we look uh, forward to our future of including a lot more insect meal in our feeds and incorporating insects because we think that they can also can eat the um, exciting products that the university has been developing for oils like camelina and <clears throat> some other great forever green products and transfer them to fish. And we might incorporate camelina in the fish diet as well, but it's exploring feeds and in increasing them. And if all goes well, Paul, with your uh, facilities, what's your capacity? How much shrimp can you raise? Um, I'm, I'm going to be quiet on that one, Dan. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 let me let me back up on that one, Dan. I'm I'm sorry. Um, I'm not going to give an uh, amount, but uh, you know we've we've worked with Ari in the past, uh, taste testing. Uh, we've got wholesalers lined up, uh, restaurants, casinos, uh, wineries, vineyards. Um, we will have enough shrimp that um, um, we will be we will need to be selling. Uh, not only here off the farm, but also having off-farm uh, sales as well. 
And for the factory, that's a different component. So there's three businesses actually here. Simply Shrimp is a raising operation, as is the shrimp shop on my farm. This is Minnesota Shrimp. The hatchery is Minnesota Shrimp. The hatchery, when we're at capacity, can raise 100 million PLs a year. So do the math, right? <laughs> <laughs> a couple shrimp. <laughs> let, let me ask all three of you, are, are you being monitored by the DNR? In the Can I step in on that one first? I, um, it, it's been a bless. I, I'm going to come back. I have had very good success with the DNR. Um, again, com keeping communication lines open. Um, I, I, I've never had a problem with the DNR. Yes, we have to get all of our permits uh, for every time that we import, uh, import shrimp in. Uh, the DNR is just doing their job. Um, another one that also keeps uh, close contacts with us is uh, MPCA. And uh, um, it, it's been, again, it, it's telling, telling them our story, educating them, and uh, putting, putting the foundation down for uh, other aquaculture facilities in the state of Minnesota. And, and it does take time. It does take legislation uh, to get to get crossed. Uh, We might have locked Paul up momentarily. There's Jessica, DNR, and you uh, and MPCA get along okay? Sure. Um, we are not currently raising walleye, so we don't work with them too much. But through the Aquaculture Association and through researching what we need in the future once we get our facility up and running, we are definitely keeping the lines of communication open and keeping the relationship there. And Nick, are they interested in the work at the U? Oh yeah, we work with uh, DNR quite a bit on all sorts of different things. Just to be clear here, um, unlike other animal production systems, the regulatory um, aspects of aquaculture fall under DNR, not Department of Ag. So it's a, a bit unique in that regard compared to other system types and even aquaculture in other states. And let's talk about aqua uh, aquaculture a little bit, or uh, 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 aquaponics. As uh, we see the waste streams being used uh, to help grow other things, are uh, both of you, uh, Nick, or uh, rather uh, Jessica or Paul or Barb, uh, are you involved in in looking what else uh, we can do to create a revenue stream? Yes, that's uh, very important. Uh, blue water farms in fully utilizing all the nutrients coming from the fish system. Paul or Barb? Yes, yep, Dan, uh, you know, this is a saltwater environment. Um, we could raise uh, sea asparagus, we can raise sea kelp. Um, there are different things uh, that we can be uh, going that direction. Um, that is gonna be down the road some sometime because right now our focus is on the hatchery, the foundation and raising the meat product, uh, raising shrimp out. but. Uh, sometime down the road, yes. Uh, believe me, we've had that discussion, but uh, there's only so many hours in a day, and uh, we got a lot on the plate, Dan. Got to take baby steps, or we got to learn to walk before we can run, or? <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, Nick, let me go back to you on the economics a little bit, and I don't know how much you've researched that, but uh, is this viable? Is this a, a farming operation that uh, investors and, and people who want to stay in agriculture uh, should be thinking about? Can we make the economics work? Hmm. That's a big question. Um, a million dollar one, maybe. The, the economics, um, so we've looked at the uh, economic question from a, a couple different angles, one for energy consumption, um, uh, willingness to pay. Um, we've done a bunch of things. I think what it, I mean, this is a, a classic problem is just the inputs and outputs. And depending on your system design um, and the species you're raising, it's going to really dictate that. Since there's so much variability, even between the two farms that are being presented here, um, that's a pretty dramatically different question. Um, so it's, it's hard to give you. I, I think, though, that I am optimistic that it could work if done at scale, and if markets are appropriately identified. Barb, you wouldn't be doing it if it, if it couldn't, right? <laughs> That's right. 
I see you kind of, I could kind of see your, the wheels were turning there a little bit. Why would we be doing this if it doesn't work? So you're optimistic that uh, we're going to be moving forward and it's, and it's going to be good for agriculture. Yeah. You know, the, the response of both the consumers and the wholesale organizations, and I would guess, Jessica, you're getting this too, of the interest in a sustainable product that they know where it came from is massive out there. It would be a long time before we fulfill all of those markets. Yes. And I would also add, um, you know, there is a lot of variability between species and the way that they're farmed and whatnot that opens up the question. But one example I was thinking about recently is that Norway invested a lot of their national research funding into getting their salmon farms up and running. And now they are a European leader and supply a lot of our farm salmon, which um, I could see that if Minnesota really wanted this ep effort to move forward and got our statewide plan together, as we're promoting, um, that we could be one of those forces as well to open up the industry. And uh, a question from one of our uh, participants today, Simply Shrimp will be selling frozen shrimp in the future. Is that on the uh, plan? We've, we're going to... Uh, we're going to be able to sell whatever kind of shrimp that the consumer wants. Uh, we'll be this next facility will be set up that we're going to be harvesting uh, every other week. Um, does the consumer want them uh, heads on, tails on, fresh, never frozen? Uh, do they want a frozen shrimp? Do they want a processed shrimp? Uh, we will be able to sell or market the shrimp, uh, whatever the consumer would like or so desire. Jessica, you mentioned uh, the uh, an advocacy for the uh, uh, state aquaculture plan. I know that there's going to be a hearing in the House Ag Finance uh, Committee uh, coming up in mid-October around that. Uh, what's Why is that important uh, to uh, Blue Water Farms? At Blue Water Farms and also just the association in general, we think that a statewide plan is important because um, there is so much variation in the industry and we could try to attack a hundred different goals at the same time, but to come together and agree on our top three priorities or five, whatever, um, and start setting aside a plan of how we're gonna tackle them over a 10 or 20 year period will really help focus in the work that's happening. How big are you gonna grow those fillets? We intend to raise them to uh, four ounces each over a year. And, uh, you know, when we catch them out of a boat, we, we think about how big is that fish. So. <laughs> a nice four ounce serving. Nice. Talk a little bit more also about the, uh, the uh, season spawn and uh, the fact that you have been able to manipulate that might be the, the right word and uh, maybe about why that's important and how many spawns a year do you think you can uh, generate? Well, I'm not sure how far we're going into proprietary information here yet. Okay. So um, to answer some of those questions, it's important to get the out of season spawn because right now we're limited to just getting eggs once a year and maybe a little variable if we're you know, willing to go to different localities to get walleye eggs. But by um, raising our own brood stock and spawning them throughout the year, not the same ones, we have to take turns, um, then we'll be able to have a continuous supply of eggs to be able to keep the fish growing um, continually through the system. So as we ship out a batch one month, then we have the next month coming in and you know, so on. Because that, that's going to be an important part of the uh, a successful right. operation is that consistent uh, supply to the yes. demand. Very much so. A lot of grocery stores and restaurateurs want to know, like, if we order 500 pounds or 5,000 pounds, will we know that it's coming in? Is that the same story for the shrimp producers? Correct. Yep. We have a question here about, can we formulate our own feed diets in Minnesota and could specialized feed plants be part of our ecosystem locally? Uh, 
I don't see why not, but I don't have a, a big opinion on that. <laughs> Yeah, yes, that is something down the road that we possibly possibly could do. Um, you know, right now, being that the, there's, there's uh, the shrimp industry here in the state of Minnesota is so small, um, you know, the, the amount of feed that we actually feed for shrimp, um, you know, what, where's, where's, the return, where's the return? How many tons of shrimp feed does a, a manufacturer have to produce to be profitable? And, and uh, today, we're just not raising enough shrimp in the state of Minnesota uh, to justify justify a feed mill. Nick, as you uh, uh, studied the feed formulations and uh, local sourcing of of those formulations, yeah, could let Jessica talk about that. Um, Jessica's project was looking at alfalfa um, protein as an alternative protein source. Um, Nick was my to... mentor, so he knows it well too. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's pretty widely accepted that. Um, the use of fish meal as a protein source is not a long-term sustainably viable strategy. And there's interest to find alternatives. Um, using something like alfalfa, which is a locally important um, product, that would be a, a value add for that industry as well. And it could be a win-win. Like soybeans are the, the same thing and chamomile and other products in the future. Jessica, we had two or three questions about mercury contamination, and I think you touched on uh, contaminant-free uh, fish uh, through blue farms or blue water farms. Uh, I assume you're talking about mercury there and the consumption restrictions that we face at times. Is that correct? That is correct. Mercury and PCBs are also another concern. So um, by having them indoors and being able to control the water and feed source, we can eliminate that as one of the concerns and be able to eat the walleye as often as you like. Uh, Paul or Barb, are there uh, restrictions in shrimp consumption? Uh, not off of my farm, the more you want it. <laughs> <laughs> the more you want it, the more you can have, huh? <laughs> when we got it. <laughs> are there restrictions worldwide on, on, on uh, other uh, ways that shrimp are uh, raised or handled? I don't think there is any, although there are many people who claim to be allergic to shrimp. And when they get shrimp from us, they're suddenly not allergic to shrimp. They're allergic to the antibiotics that uh, they're using overseas. And, and again, research down the road, this is something that I'm very excited to dig into. Uh, uh, you know, why, why can people eat? And again, we got to be careful how we say this, but you know, why, why do people break out from foreign seas, uh, overseas shrimp, but yet can eat Minnesota shrimp uh, without breaking out? Uh, again, that, that'll be researched down the road sometime. Okay. How, what's, what's a common or most popular shrimp size? Uh, we, we market we market all of our shrimp out at uh, 20 gram 20 gram between 20 to 22 grams a, a pound uh, so roughly a 20 count so per pound 20 to 22 shrimp per pound but that's live yeah head on okay. and how much uh, do we wait uh, how much is uh, when or after the process do you lose we lose about uh, tw uh, 27 percent when they're processed um, with this company, Minnesota company that uh, has manufactured the processing machine, uh, there's other revenue sources that will come off of the shells, the heads. Uh, there's a value for every product, every product of the shrimp. Harold, I might ask you to come back in if you've got some specific questions for uh, any of our guests today uh, as well. But uh, I did want uh, Jessica to touch a little bit on that RAS system. A little bit more about what that is and, and why that's uh, a significant in indoor aquaculture. Um, recirculating aquaculture has been around, I think maybe since the 90s, but definitely since the early 2000s. And um, it's just a technology to filter and reuse the same water. And with all the automated technology, we can also keep a really close eye on how that water quality is changing and working out through time. And with uh, aquaponics, which partners plants with the stream, you can fully recirculate the water through the system or divert part of it to the plants 
and um, more fully utilize the water over and over again. I'll have to refer to Paul and Barb. I would guess that with a salt water creation, you want to recirculate that as much as possible so you don't have to create new salt water over and over. Yeah, that's correct. Salt water is very expensive and uh, the longer we can use it, the longer we can uh, keep it, keep it uh, within our parameters, uh, we're going to continue to reuse it. Uh, Dan, uh, I have a question for Dr. Nick Phelps. Uh, uh, what services do the University of Minnesota under your program offer to the aquaculture industry? Yeah, so we we're interested and eager to partner with um, the industry to think through research ideas. Um, that's one aspect where we've uh, done a lot of work. Um, we have some outreach capacity, just um, uh, you know, connect you with information, think through um, information sharing with questions that you may have. Um, then at the the College of Veterinary Medicine, the, the diagnostic lab, uh, they provide diagnostic service for fish health um, issues that you might experience. And that'll be very important uh, for both of our operators here to, to know what you don't know from time to time, for sure. Um, I want to just get into a little bit here in our last moments uh, for, for Paul and Barb and, and Jessica, because I've worked with you both. Uh, we know what a journey this is uh, to, to get something from idea to reality. Uh, there's a lot of things to think about business-wise, and uh, maybe you folks could just touch a little bit about, you know, the feasibility process that you looked at and going forward. Uh, you know, tell us the challenges of financing a bit, and uh, just go down that road just a little bit, because these are very, very important things to consider as you get the strength, financial strength you need to move forward. So maybe Jessica, we'll start with you. I've worked with Blue Water right from the start and I've seen some amazing work come out of uh, Blue Water Farms and uh, getting awfully close to having a razor sharp business plan there. Uh, Jessica, maybe just talk about that for a minute. Sure, um, well, I will say that Minnesota in general has a great environment for businesses with a lot of support from the Small Business Association and the Department of Employment and Economic Development. I have those E's so switched, I don't know. Um, and that we've gotten a lot of support through grants as well as through um, just very generous advisors that are willing to work with us and share their knowledge and um, thinking on all of our ideas. And we uh, have struggled to find investors, which I think is a struggle for both new businesses as well as aquaculture, because in the US, there aren't a zillion aquaculture businesses out there to really show investors how the future numbers will play out. And uh, we're keep on searching our founders and CEO Clarence Bischoff is really great at making connections and reaching out to people. He's been traveling recently, so he couldn't be here today, but um, well, knocking wanna, on doors. Yeah, Keep I want to thank, uh, <laughs> thank you, Jessica, because uh, I know how hard you, you folks have, uh, have worked to put all that together. You've got great documentation, and I do want to call out the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and their grant programs through the value-added producer grants and so forth have been extremely helpful, and uh, their feasibility grant program early on was just so helpful to get uh, the help we needed to, to help uh, both uh, Simply Shrimp, uh, Minnesota Hatchery, and Blue Water Farms get going. But Paul, on your end too, I mean, uh, as you're looking at a potential new investment there in, in good old Wilmer Bloomquist area, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, about the kind of help you've got, particularly locally. I mean, uh, the EDA over there has been, is, is a pretty fantastic operation. That and, and you know, AURI stepping up and helping out, and, and uh, our EDC here in Wilmer has uh, really stepped up to the plate, too. Um, we started a feasibility study. The first feasibility study was probably three years ago. Um, since then, it's been updated numerous times. And again, you know, going getting financing lined up, uh, go back raising corn, soybeans. Uh, other farmers are doing it. Uh, this is where your expenses are, this is your income. 
and uh, cash flows. Well, in the shrimp industry, um, in aquaculture as a whole, I, I'm sorry, Jessica. You know, how do you how do you go to the bank and say, hey, I'm going to raise X amount of pounds of uh, fish or shrimp. This is what my expenses are going to be, and away you go. And and that's why you know uh, to start to start on small scale scale it up uh, to get your expenses, to get your efficiencies. Um, our feasibility study today is a lot more accurate than what it was three years ago. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll throw one more back in there too, Harold. Uh, the construction, you know, uh, we've got a, a very good general contractor that uh, is helping me out on this facility. And, uh, you know, when you sit down and visit with them, how many aquaculture facilities have you built? And and that's why, you know, th this is all new and, and uh, the expenses and, and we can take our best guesses uh, about it, but until you actually do it, um, they're kind of fictitious numbers in a roundabout way too. Well, uh, and uh, Paul and Barb, uh, with, with your operation there, Paul, the way you started uh, um, with simply shrimp and raising some on-farm shrimp and having some sales early on and just getting that basic knowledge kind of almost at a pilot scale the way you did it and proving to yourself that that you could raise uh, some absolutely phenomenal uh, high protein fish uh, seafood it, it, it was it was great to see and and uh, I, I just want to call that out but you know, just looking at this whole scenario as we move forward, there are lots of things that we probably don't know. And as we go with each other through the help of Nick through the University of Minnesota and all the state agencies, DNR and so forth, who want to help move this thing forward, I think we need to share. And one of the things, Jessica, that I learned early on with your CEO, uh, Clarence Bishop, he he dragged me out to the Great Lakes Aquaculture Center in Bayfield, Wisconsin, and showed me, because I didn't quite believe it, that we could raise indoor walleye efficiently and effectively. And uh, Greg Fisher over there and the team spent some time with us and really pointed out the, the, the systems approach of what you've got there. And uh, so what a resource. Uh, uh, with our friends uh, in Wisconsin to get some uh, help. And I'm glad to see that they're on your team, Jessica. And you might want to make a comment about that. Yeah, um, thank you for sending it back. I do agree that proving out the system is really important and having the knowledge behind it. And as you might have heard, Blue Water Farms hasn't raised a walleye yet, but we do have that great support of knowledgeable experts um, between working in recirculating aquaculture and building out the systems for many years or domesticating walleye and breeding perkid fish. Um, we have the experts that have done the aquaculture business that we're looking to get into and they're our foundation. Well, well thank you, Jessica. And, and Dan, uh, one final comment I have before I turn it back to you and it is, how do you get a hold of us at AURI uh, so that we can help you with the resources we have in, in our networks. And the best way to do that is just simply go to our website, uh, auri.org. Uh, and on there, it tells you how to get a hold of us. And when you get a hold of us, we'll come and see you. We'll, we'll uh, examine where, where you're at. And then let's get started deeper in the woods as we move forward, because pretty soon we're going to have a walleye dinner and a shrimp uh, a dinner and uh, all, everything is going to be good. So uh, from eggs to shrimp, from dairy to shrimp, from from social services to uh, raising uh, walleye. Uh, Nick, you just never know where things can go these days. And that's why we all need to be dynamic. And uh, I'll turn it back to you, Dan. Thank you, Harold. Uh, Dr. Nick, uh, Jessica, uh, Paul and Barb, uh, thank you very much for the uh, information that you brought forward today. And and uh, best of luck, too, as you uh, continue on those endeavors. We appreciate your time. Do want to note once again that we did have some difficulties with connecting early on in our program today, but uh, if you did join us late, the entire conversation was recorded and will be available, as Harold mentioned, at auri.org. And uh, if you go to auri.org, uh, you will also find a list of all of our staff, and uh, you can reach out to us individually or as a organization, and we will be responsive to your questions. 
That does conclude AURI Connect's fields of innovation for today. It's been presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. Here's an invitation to join AURI on the Fields of Innovation Facebook group for future postings of events and other interesting content. Thank you again for participating today and remember to visit the Fields of Innovation Facebook page. For more information on Fields of Innovation or any of the work that AURI is involved in, just go to auri.org.